Welcome to Martin Van Buren National Historic Site in Kinderhook, New York. I'm Ranger Andrew, and here we preserve Lindenwald, the estate of our nation's eighth president, Martin Van Buren. As a ranger at the park, part of my job is to tell the story of Van Buren and the land that he owned. The way we normally talk about Van Buren romanticizes him as an example of the American dream. Van Buren went from the son of a rural tavern keeper to the president of the United States, hitting every office in between. After his presidency, Van Buren returned to his native town and purchased the home of his old political rival, Judge Peter Van Ness. Although his home is the center of our site here, the estate also includes Van Buren's 220-acre farm, which is still actively farmed today. Van Buren was quite proud of this farm because to him, it felt like following in the footsteps of his idol, Thomas Jefferson, who believed that the future of democracy depended on independent farmers. All in all, Van Buren spent the last 20 years of his life here, and in his own words, they were some of his best. I, Martin Van Buren of the town of Kinderhook, County of Columbia, State of New York, heretofore governor of the state and more recently president of the United States, but my last and happiest years of my life, a farmer in my native town. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be a farmer? If you Google the phrase American farmer, Van Buren would fit right in with these white men. But the truth is that Van Buren was not representative of most of the people who worked this land. The earliest group that we know of who farmed this area were the First Nations peoples who lived here. These farms were usually small and used for subsistence or trade. As Van Buren's ancestor Cornelius Meissen and other Europeans arrived in the 1600s, farming would change radically as Europeans forced First Nations populations out of the area. Just as in the South, slavery was not just present, but prominent in New York. The Dutch brought in the first enslaved persons in New York in 1626, and they were primarily involved in agriculture throughout the Hudson Valley, which is one of the things that they were doing for Judge Peter Van Ness in 1797 when Lindenwald was built. According to the second U.S. Census in 1800, Van Ness owned 10 enslaved people who worked on the site. Also on the census, under Van Ness, are two other free persons, most likely former enslaved people that had either purchased their freedom or been purposefully freed, as this was before the abolition of slavery in New York in 1827. In 1839, Van Buren purchased Lindenwald and began to farm the land behind the home. The labor consisted of tenant farmers and domestic servants, many of whom were German and Irish immigrants. Some lived here on the site, such as Van Buren's farm manager. While the European immigrants who worked in the house are well documented, less is known about people who farmed the lands of the estate. Over the last couple of years, the Park Service has been deeply interested in getting to the bottom of this mystery. Thankfully, Kinderhook Village historian Ruth Pawanka has been doing research on this topic. Andrew, over here. Oh, hey, Ruth. We're just talking about your research. Uh, would you be willing to talk to us more about it? I would be very glad to, but a trade-off. I want a special tour of the house. I think we can do that. Okay, let's go. So, how did slavery end in New York State? Did it happen overnight, or was it a long or gradual process? Well, it was definitely a gradual process that began in the 1790s. It basically covered about a generation. It was extended up to 1827. What was life like for freed slaves in Kinderhook? So, you have to kind of make educated guesses and surmises. In fact, we don't really know a whole lot about it. The church records show that beginning in the 1790s, the church was hiring some black people to help clean or make repairs to the building. In fact, there was a black community outside of the Kinderhook village where at least some of the black people own their own land. What is important, you can find these people on a map in the county clerk's office in the deeds, but not everybody owned their land. You can find there were more people living there because in the census you can find the landowners, plus you find the other people who are not landowners. 
Would it have been possible that members of the community would have worked here on the farm at Lindenwald? I think that is possible. Perhaps they might have come seasonally and worked at this farm, maybe gone on to another farm to work. If you want to learn more about it, you should talk to my friend Matthew Kirk, who's done work and research at the Persons of Color Cemetery in Kinderhook Village. Are you Matthew? I am. Andrew, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. So Ruth told me you would be a good source of information about the Persons of Color Cemetery. So Andrew, I'm an archeologist and I had the opportunity to conduct an archeological excavation here at the cemetery about two years ago. How did the cemetery get established here in the first place? The historical records indicate that a local landowner, John Rogers, deeded part of his property to be used as Persons of Color Cemetery. Is this the entire cemetery? I thought after talking to Ruth that the black community in Kinderhook was far larger than just these few stones. So the archeology span has shown that this probably is a much larger cemetery than what's represented by the stones that you see here today alone. In our very small excavation of only about three by four feet, we found evidence of at least three grave shafts, which suggests that there's probably hundreds of individuals buried here at the cemetery. Not only that, the archeology span also suggests that the headstones have been moved and the orientation of the grave shafts are north to south as opposed to east to west, what's shown with the headstones today. We don't really know when or how the headstones were moved. Um, the cemetery has obviously been in existence for over a hundred years and throughout that time, headstones have probably fallen over, have been propped back up and moved around. They've clearly been vandalized over the years as well. So the headstones don't really represent where these individuals are buried. What do you think the presence of a place like this tells us about Kinderhook at the time? So there was a very large, very active African-American community in Kinderhook throughout the late 18th, throughout the 19th century. That community has largely been dispersed today. And so places like this remind us about that type of community and how important it was to the overall town and county. So when was this added to the National Register of Historic Places? In 2016, a group of local citizens came together and decided that this was an important part of the historical fabric of Kinderhook. And they agitated and succeeded in getting the National Park Service to recognize this as a historical place. This cemetery is immediately adjacent to three baseball fields now. Is this fairly common across other sites related to African Americans? Unfortunately, throughout most of the 19th century and especially the 20th century, many of the places associated with African-Americans has been removed from the larger landscape. After that African-American community often was removed from the area, they still remain public spaces. So over time, when these cemeteries lost their headstones, they were often turned into public parks. To return to the previous question, what does it mean to be a farmer? We often praise Van Buren for being a successful farmer, and he certainly does deserve some of the credit for the work that was done here. However, we will never fully understand American history without recognizing the work of marginalized peoples, in this case, the black farmers who worked on this land and in the communities surrounding it. In the words of Frederick Douglass, all great qualities are never found in any one man or any one race. The whole of humanity, like the whole of everything else, is ever greater than a part.